No matter what else is happening in the world. There is always good news today. Welcome to Good News Today, the program where you will always find good news no matter what else is happening in the world. I'm Mark Teske, your host for Good News Today. I want to thank you for joining us. We have got a great spiritual feast today, and here's what's on the menu. We'll begin with our devotional time as we do, and that consists of our scripture reading, beautiful singing, and a brief study of that scripture. Today, we'll be looking at Micah chapter 5, verse number 2, one of many Old Testament passages that makes the case that Jesus is eternal. So get out your Bibles, turn to Micah chapter 5. I'll meet you there in just a moment. Following our devotional time, Troy Spradlin will be with us from his workshop, and he'll be repairing our understanding once again. Today, he'll be talking about how we can repair our spiritual eyesight with spiritual glasses. Jim Dearman's in the studio, and he's got some sound words for us as he thinks back to a time when men were exploring the moon. Then Roger Campbell is ready, as always, to answer a question from the Bible. Today, he'll be answering a question about the wise men that came to visit the baby Jesus. In our final segment, we have a Bible question for Guyton Montgomery and Troy Spradlin. They're in a new location, but they're together and answering your questions. Today, the question we pose to them is this. When Jesus came to earth as a baby, did he bring all of his wisdom and knowledge into his infant body? It's a very interesting question and one they'll answer once again from the Bible. Well, I hope you have your Bible opened up to Micah chapter 5, where we read verse number 2. But you, Bethlehem Ephrathah, though you are little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of you shall come forth to me the one to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth are from old, from everlasting. book of Micah is not one that we typically go to on a regular basis. It's what's referred to as one of the minor prophets. So it helps to have a little background about the book as to help us understand what it is we're reading about. The prophet Micah prophesied to both Israel and Judah, the northern and southern kingdoms, around the time that Israel was about to be carried away into captivity. He was prophesying about the same time as Isaiah 
and uh, around the time of King Hezekiah. There in the nations, it was a time of great sin, treachery, and there was warfare around them continually. Now, the northern kingdom, Israel, was about to be carried away and defeated. Uh, the Assyrians would take them away. Judah would be in grave danger. All of this came about because God could tolerate their sin no more. And part of Micah's message is to prepare the people for the captivity, those in the southern kingdom, the captivity that's going to come to them in just a few years. But there would be a remnant that would return. Here in chapter 5 alone, there are three different times that word remnant shows up. And as we think about the book of Micah, our passage is probably the most quoted verse in this entire book. And it begins talking about this place called Bethlehem Ephrathah. You see, during the time of, uh, that this was written in the time of Jesus, there was two towns named Bethlehem. This Bethlehem Ephrathah, there in Judah, was about six miles southwest of Jerusalem. And there was another one about four miles northwest of Nazareth, up in Galilee. So this is being very specific. It's this one down here we're talking about. And that word Ephrathah, uh, that was specific to David. Matter of fact, in 1 Samuel 17, verse 12, uh, David is referred to the Ephrathite. Uh, that's, that's what's used there in that passage. So as we get to the New Testament, after the wise men came to visit King Herod to ask about who, where the king was born, he asked the chief priests and the scribes where the Christ was to be born. And he was told, Bethlehem of Judea. Because of this very prophecy, we see that in Matthew 2, verses 3 through 6. And it appears to be common knowledge among all the people that the Messiah would indeed come from Bethlehem, John chapter 7, verse 42. So it describes the one coming from Bethlehem as one to be the ruler. Uh, this would be the Messiah or the Christ, Messiah being a Hebrew word, Christ being a Greek word. And, and the one who would come to be ruler is the one who's setting up a kingdom made without hands that should never be destroyed and stand forever, Daniel chapter 2, verse 44. So with all of this information there, uh, the Jews were asking the question, Matthew 12, 23, after Jesus did some miracles, could this be the son of David? Referring back to this fact that he would come from David's lineage and be born in David's town. When Jesus made that triumphal entry into Jerusalem, Hosanna to the son of David, that same phrase that was used. Our passage also tells us that his goings forth are from old, from everlasting. This is a clear statement of the eternal nature of Jesus. That word everlasting, literally days of eternity. Jesus was before the world was created. He said in John chapter 8, beginning in verse 56, Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. Then the Jews said to him, You are not yet fifty years old. How have you seen Abraham? Jesus said to them, Most assuredly I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. So we see that Jesus had that eternal nature. It wasn't something he made up. It was something that was prophesied in the Old Testament as well as in the New Testament. We could also look at Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14, where he's called Emmanuel, which means God with us, Matthew 1, 23. Uh, passages like John 1, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. So we see all these passages look to the eternal nature of Jesus. What a great Savior that we have, and that's good news for us today. Now, Troy Spradlin's in his workshop. He's going to be repairing something, and that would be our understanding about glasses, spiritual glasses. Many years ago, there was a popular country and western song that was playing on the radio that made a very interesting point. The lyrics of the song described how the singer saw his relationship with the one that he loved. You see, in his eyes, everything was just great and wonderful, when in reality, that was far from the truth. He wanted to believe that his love interest still needed him and that they continued to share good times together. But at the end of each verse, he revealed that that was just a dream because 
she certainly didn't feel the same way about him. In each course, the singer described his preferred view of the situation in a more beautiful way. He sang, but these rose-colored glasses that I'm looking through show only the beauty because they hide all the truth. You know, many of us do that same thing. We choose how we're going to see the world and how we will allow ourselves to see it. Think about how a, a soldier in a hostile battle situation sees the world. He's going to see certain people as a potential threat, and thus his worldview will be shaped by his surroundings. You think about a doctor. He or she is going to look at people from a medical perspective, concerned more about things that, that they observe regarding health issues. And the same applies for a detective or a teacher or a mechanic or, or anyone. It, it affects their worldview. You see, people choose to see the world with optimism or pessimism, skepticism, opportunism, and all kinds of perspectives. And in every case, we all put on a certain type of glasses, which affects our worldview. Just like John Connolly's song, Rose Colored Glasses, well, there's a spiritual application here. What about a Christian's worldview? How should a disciple of Jesus Christ view the world in which he or she lives? I think the first clue is found in Colossians 3, verse 12, that says, Set your mind on things above, not on things of the earth. That kind of says it all, doesn't it? Now, how do you do that is found in passages like Philippians chapter 2, verse 4, when it says, Let each of you look out not only for his own interest, but also for the interest of others. When a Christian steps out into the world, they should carry with them a servant's heart, ready to exhibit Jesus from within themselves. And Jesus even stated, Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. In Matthew 5, verse 16. You see, putting such virtues into practice is going to change how you see the world. It will impact your attitude towards all the people that come into your life. We could even add passages like Romans chapter 12, verse 2 to this application that says, And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. This will certainly impact how you see the world around you. You will be more clearly able to distinguish between good and evil. Things that worldly people yearn for won't interest you. In fact, you'll be able to see things that worldly people never really think about, mainly spiritual things. You'll have a discernment and a comprehension that many simply do not have. You see, it's through this type of worldview that we can see souls. And instead of seeing people as threats or objects or in some other superficial way, we can see beyond the outward appearance and see them as God does, as a precious soul. So as Christians, this should repair our understanding of how we see the world when we choose to put on our spiritual glasses and see souls. Thanks, Troy. Now it's time to grab some paper and something to write with so you can write down our contact information. If you haven't yet enrolled in our correspondence course, it's a great way for you to implement that New Year's resolution. Remember, the courses are free of charge. Jim Dearman's going to be with us after this brief break. You may have questions or comments about Good News Today. We'd like to hear from you. Or if you would like to receive free Bible study materials, please contact us. Our mailing address is Good News Today, P.O. Box 206, Dunlap, Tennessee, 37327. Again, that's Good News Today, P.O. Box 206, Dunlap, Tennessee, 37327. You may prefer to email us at goodnewstodaytv at gmail.com. That's goodnewstodaytv at gmail.com. Or call us toll-free at 1-877-877. 384-7221. That's 1-877-384-7221. We'd like to hear from you. 
Hearing from our audience is always good news to us. Remember, you can always sign up for a correspondence course right there on our website. We're pleased to partner with Truth.fm to bring you a 24-7 stream of good news today right there on their website or on their app. In addition to the Good News Today channel, they also have several others that contain excellent Bible lessons. The truth is always being preached at Truth.fm. Now here's Jim Dearman with some sound words about a time when men were exploring the moon. We will live eternally if we obey It's been several years since America sent men to the moon. When Frank Borman, James Lovell, and William Anders, the Apollo 8 crew, were hovering above the moon's surface, Anders read these words as the TV camera flashed back a remarkable picture of the lunar landscape. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. You know, we've made some great strides, technologically speaking, since that time. However, one wonders if the scripture would be quoted today in a similar situation. Is mankind more mindful of God today than then? We wish we could answer yes. How ironic it is that advances may be made in some areas, but not in the one area of greatest importance. When William Anders saw that great spectacle from space, he was struck by the realization that God had brought it into existence. Today, too many men are looking for ways to separate God from His creation. We're not advancing in every sense, are we? We will live eternally if we obey someone. Thanks for those thoughts, Jim. You may have recently gotten a new electronic device. We've got an app for it. We've got the material you'll see on the program as well as excellent material from years gone by. We've got over 1,700 videos that are all available right there, so there's plenty of good teaching. Remember, we've got an app for that. Look for the Good News Today app in the App Store. Download it for free. Now, Roger Campbell is going to answer a question about three wise men. Be ready always. What if someone were to ask you, where does the Bible tell us that three wise men came to bring gifts to Jesus? You know, as a Christian, God wants you and me to be ready to give a defense or give an answer. 1 Peter 3 and verse number 15. It's a historical fact that wise men sought for Jesus. It's a historical fact that those wise men found him. And it's a historical fact that they gave him gifts. And the only place in the Bible where we read about those wise men doing that is Matthew chapter 2. In verse 1 of that chapter, we learn that when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem. So they were introduced to these wise men. They came, they were following a star, and when they learned that according to Old Testament prophecy, the Christ was to be born in Bethlehem, to Bethlehem they went. And the Bible says in Matthew chapter 2 and verse number 11. And when they were come into the house, that's interesting. It wasn't at the manger. They came into the house. And what did they do? They saw the young child with Mary his mother and fell down and worshiped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented unto him gifts, gold, and frankincense, and myrrh. And then when they were warned of God in a dream, they returned home following a different route. You say, well, you've answered our question. You've showed us, it's in Matthew 2, that we read about those three wise men coming to visit Jesus. Hold on just a second. How many wise men did you say there were? He said, what, three? Well, Where'd you learn that? You say, well, I've, I've been coloring pictures since I was a little kid. There's always three camels and, and one person on each of those camels. And there are songs about it. And I've seen those manger scenes. 
The Bible doesn't say there were three wise men. You say, oh, come on. It it doesn't. Again, if you follow what it says, there were wise men, plural. And then the pronoun they and the pronoun them. What we know for certain is there were at least two, more than one. Just like when we read in Acts 14 and verse 23 that Paul and Barnabas helped those local churches doing what? Appointing elders in every church. Well, how many were there? There were elders, plural, at least two. Could have been two, could have been seven. You say, well, weren't there three gifts that those wise men gave to Jesus? Bingo. Gold, frankincense, and myrrh. But let me ask you this. Is it possible for one giver to give more than one type of gift? The Bible's answer is yes. Remember what the Bible says about God himself, Acts 17, 25? He gives to all men life, and breath, and all things. That's one giver with multiple gifts. Or maybe you've experienced this. You or someone else you know, someone passed away, and for the funeral, flowers were given by three nephews. Three nephews going together to give one gift. So the number of givers doesn't say anything about how many gifts, and the number of gifts doesn't prove how many givers. Stick with what the Bible says, and we'll follow the right path. I'm Roger Cannon, and this has been Be Ready Always. Thanks, Roger. Are you going to make a New Year's resolution to spend more time in Bible study? One way to do that is through the Good News Today podcast, available wherever you get your podcast. Just search for Good News Today Daily Devotional Time and start every day with a daily dose of good news. Subscribe and get an early start on that resolution. Just a moment, we'll give our Bible question to Guyton and Troy. They'll answer it after this brief break. When Jesus came to earth as a baby, did he bring all of his wisdom and knowledge into his infant body? Stay tuned. Hey, Troy, I got a question for you. Okay, let's see here. How big a baby were you when you were born? (laughs) I I think it was a pretty good sized baby, though I'm not a very big man now, so. You know, I'm not sure how big I was. Really? I'm sure you were a big baby. (laughs) (laughs) Are we talking about size or the way I acted? Uh, Both. Okay. No, the reason I ask that, it's really strange when I start thinking that Jesus, you know, the one that John chapter one, verse one through five tells us that without him, not anything in this world would have been created, Uh that he came into this world as a baby being born of woman. That's right. That's exactly right. And that leads us actually to our question that we have for today. Okay. All right. So the question as it was given to me says, when Jesus came to earth as a baby, did he bring all of his wisdom and knowledge into his infant body? Ah, all of his wisdom or knowledge. That's a, that's a great question. I, in my mind, immediately I go to Philippians chapter two. Okay. I mean, when it's talking about, did he bring all that with him? Obviously he came down from heaven, which is exactly what Paul says in Philippians chapter two, but he goes on to say that Christ emptied himself. He made himself of no reputation in verse seven. Some versions, depending on what you read, will say he emptied himself or he, he basically one version I found says that he gave up everything and became a slave like one of us. Oh yeah. That word that's there literally means to lay aside. Uh, or to vacate. That's right. Exactly. Yeah, and, and that that really just opened my eyes when I was reading that and studying that. It's the idea that he would lay it aside, vacate all that power, all yes. that knowledge. He was equal to God. 
Yeah, it, but it had to be for two reasons, mm-hmm. I would actually argue. Luke 2 is a passage that mm-hmm. a lot of times we may overlook it, but when you read it in verse 52, it says, And Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. So certainly he grew in stature physically, it's talking about, but it also says in wisdom. Well, God has all wisdom. He is the source of wisdom according right. to the book of Proverbs. And so if he grew in wisdom, this verse tells us he had to lay that aside so that he can come to earth and to be able to experience what we experience, to grow the way we grow, and really to fulfill passages like what Hebrews chapter 4 talks about. Well, that I love that verse because the wisdom that he has there is talking about having full knowledge. And if he was going to grow and be 100% man, because we read, in, for example, in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15, that he was tempted in all things as we are, he had to be just like us. He had to feel those things. He had to learn them just like we had to learn them. But there is the point where he does become 100% deity also. He's 100% deity, 100% uh, a man, but we, we never understand that. That's a difficult concept to wrap our brains around. Yes, and, and it is difficult. But remember, it, just even the miraculous, somebody said to me one time, was like, can you imagine Jesus running around doing all these miracles as a child? And there's actually nothing in Scripture to show us that. That's right. In fact, it's only after, what is it, John chapter 4, where Jesus went to John the Baptist to be baptized, that God spoke from heaven. The Spirit comes down like as of a dove upon him. And it's after that we see the first miracle recorded for us of Jesus. So the implication would be that because he vacated himself, it was that Holy Spirit coming down to Mm -hmm. give him the power for the miraculous. Absolutely. Absolutely. So did Jesus vacate himself? Did he empty himself completely as he he came as a baby? Um, Wisdom or knowledge in infant body? Um, Yes. Um, He was just like we are. And that makes his sacrifice all that much more important. Amen. I really appreciate the truth that they just laid forth from the Word of God. It makes me appreciate Jesus even more. We'd like to encourage you to always check what we've taught or anybody teaches against the Scriptures. If you need to hear our program again, you can go to our website, our apps, uh, go to our YouTube channel or podcast. If you have any questions, contact us. We love to hear from you. Maybe you have a question you'd like to answer on the program. We can take care of that. Remember that we love you, we're praying for you, and we want you to make it to heaven. Always good news. Good news, good news. There is good news today. Good news, good news, the world always good news. Good news, good news, there is good news today. All around the world, good news, good news, the world always good news. Good news, good news, there is good news today.